Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. You can easily distinguish my guest in the crowd with her spiky platinum blonde hair. It's her creativity and drive that defines her as a chef, pastry chef, TV personality, author, and food consultant. My guest today is Elizabeth Faulkner, and this is episode 63 of the Flavors Unknown podcast. With Elizabeth Faulkner, we go over more than 20 years of her career from Citizen Cake in San Francisco to Crescendo in Brooklyn. We talk about our creative process, a recent trip to China, and about her view about the future of the industry. I am your host, Emmanuel LaRoche. I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US. And every other week, I interview chefs, pastry chefs, and mixologists from around the country. Before we start, I have a favor to ask. We posted a survey in the show description at flavorsunknown.com. We would love to have your feedback on your liking, what we can do better about the show. It takes only a few minutes, so tell us what you think. And if you do, you can be one of the three winners of a raffle and get a $75 Amazon gift card. So thank you in advance for your input. Hi, Chef. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm very good. And welcome to uh, Flavors Unknown. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. I'm so I'm actually very excited to talk to you as well. You know, all we have are these like uh, virtual arenas these days. So I'm, just, yeah. I'm happy to have a conversation about food and travel and whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You you have done so much things and evolved, you know, across like the, the years. Uh, so you have opened, you know, several restaurants. You you have been into a lot of, um, you know, competition show, like cooking competition shows. Uh-huh. Uh, you have been uh, James Beard finalist in 2005 as a, a pastry chef. So mm-hmm. You are, I don't know if you still are, or but I know you involved, I mean, you were president of the WCR, the Women Chefs and Restaurateurs. So I don't know if you're still the president now or. Actually, it's kind of, it, it's a, it's a good story. I was a mem- early member of, Women Chefs and Restaurant Tours when it started 30 years ago, because one of my former bosses, one of my former chefs was one of the founders. And of course, I knew all those women who started that organization just because they weren't getting enough attention for the amazing work that they were already doing 30 years ago in the industry. And they just weren't getting as much recognition as their male colleagues. And so I've been a member all these years. And then I became the president in 2015. And then I was brought back on later And then coincidentally, and almost kind of perfect, I guess, sort of full circle is that we had a meeting right before the pandemic hit us in New York, and we decided that it was time to wind up business. So we were in a good black, positive cash flow space, but we found that the last five years, honestly, were very hard, very challenging to raise money for the Mm -hmm. organization because, in fact, there are just so many nonprofits and there are a lot more you know, a lot more focus on women in the industry in the last yeah. few years since the Me Too movement. So we just kind of decided, you know, I think that the found what the founders initially had started, we had had run its course, and we decided it would be in our best interest in the in best interest of women going in the business going forward to actually wind it down and look at other organizations to support. In a way, this is a good sign. I think you know, then for for women in uh, in the industry, correct? If that's um, right, yeah. Yeah, that, I think that, so, because and also like, you know, since it's all volunteer board of directors and, you know, I had a, a really great board of directors, very, you know, a bunch of superstars from Tiffany Faison to Amanda Cohen to uh-huh. um, Karen Akunowix and uh, Kelly Fields and just so many amazing people, Servi Sani, just from all over the place. And we were all just in the last couple of years getting pulled more and more into other events and other, I would say like a lot of the nonprofits have been focusing on women in the industry, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But then we've been asked to do all the dinners, all the events, you know, so it's like, we cannot run an organization where we have to ask ourselves to do more and more. more. I mean, like, we always want to do more. 
But like, it just seemed like there were already so many different groups and representation happening that we felt like it would be better to put our energy in some of these newer ones or basically put our heads together. And then we started collaborating with the Beard Foundation too. So, I mean, I have a lot of hope for the future of where we're going with food stuff. Great. In general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, with everything that I've mentioned, you know, before and including the WCR and then your passion as well for martial art, you know, and where, oh, do you, yeah. where, where do you find the, your, your drive? Where is your drive coming from? You know, I think it's kind of just my nature. I have somebody who grew up in a very artistic family. And then when I was in college, I ended up finishing at San Francisco Art Institute and studying experimental art and experimental mm-hmm. film installations. And then I simultaneously was working at William Sonoma at the original store in San Francisco. Yeah. And, um, and so I f- kind of both, you know, was honing my sort of desire to, to look at different mediums in different ways and falling in love with the food revolution of California that was happening all around me in the late eighties. So then I think when I, when I started cooking, I've, I really committed myself to learning so much of the craft and the tradition and the foundations of cooking and fine dining uh, through, you know, some great chefs from Julian Serrano to Tracy Desjardins. I was focused on pastry only because I I kind of excelled at it really fast, even though I never wanted to just be a pastry chef. um, Mm -hmm. I just kind of like that's how I started. And then when I opened up my own places, I, I kind of liked the idea of, you know, eventually I was like, I've got to open a bakery, but I'm certainly not going to make, you know, carrot cake with marzipan or piped <laughs> carrots. I wanted everything to be so, I had come from plated food, you know, so I wanted yeah, the yeah. cakes and the pastries to be super special in their textures and flavors. And then and I, I think had this to- is when, that is in fact where I, when I met you, I think in 2008, you were the owner of the Citizen Cake, correct? Story. Yeah. In- so at that time. Yeah, so I had Citizen Cake for 15 years, and then I opened up a little satellite cafe called Citizen Cupcake for four mm-hmm. years, and then I had another restaurant called Orson that was very modern and edgy. So uh, to answer your question, I think that I've always liked to sort of understand the basis of any kind of culture or language around food, and then also see what where else I can take it. So I do. I've been doing that for so many years now, where I. I might, you know, and I've done, I make very classic traditional food sometimes, but I also love the modernism and the changing things up, not just for the fun of it, but just to kind of play with people's perception. So full story coming full circle is like probably at Star Chefs, you saw that one time I was a brand ambassador for any cheese for a few yep. years, yep. Switz- the cheeses from Switzerland. And mm-hmm. I decided to, I had gone to Switzerland with them and met, you know, all these cheesemakers and tasted you know, the Kaltbach cave age cheeses in the, at the base of the Alps where they put all this, all the best of the Swiss cheeses to age. And yeah. then, um, I had met cheesemakers and the dairy cows and some, you know, just the whole experience of learning how to make that cheese. And the t- so I transformed that into like, how can I, they asked me if I could redo that in some kind of installation. And I built this. Did you see this one? The ter- time yeah, yes, I, I, went, yeah, I went inside. Yeah. yeah, you had that this, uh, you know, and a the, full experience, you know, the, absolutely. Yeah, the making the fragrances yeah. of the of the cheese process from from the pasture to the cheesemaker to the aging to yeah. the final tasting notes. So transforming that into perfumes was like, you know, I just thought that's going to be a good way to tell this story. Easier than just talking about it and tasting the cheese, which is always a good, fun idea. Oh, that was, that was a good thing, because one of my favorite uh, Swiss cheese is the Appenzeller. You get from my accent that obviously I'm from the other side of the ocean, and mm-hmm. and I spent a lot of years, uh, my youth, with my parents uh, traveling to uh, Interlaken and, uh, you know, the German side of uh, of Switzerland. So, okay. yeah, I, I love those kind of cheeses. So, yeah, that, that was a great, uh, a great experience that you put together at, at uh, the Congress. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm was- finding myself back in this place too, where like almost like coming back around to my bachelor's degree in fine art, where I, I want to make experiences and or films or stuff that I kind of studied a long time ago. But I, you know, I think restaurants have represented a different kind of theater for me all these years. Cause, and they, you know, even when you do lineup in a restaurant, it's often like you're talking to your 
it's almost like when we, uh, the last restaurant I opened in the Upper West Side of New York, I would talk to the to the front of the house and the staff about how this was. We're, this is a Broadway show. This is not off Broadway. We're like we have to perform like we're on Broadway every night here, every day, every huh. night. And I would I also like played soccer most of my life, so I always kind of think about my world as and I love those food competitions. So my world is often about this combination of food and sport, or food and art, and mm-hmm. them all coming together. You know, the competition, the cooking competition that you, um, you know, you have done and you have done so many of them and you have been competing and you have been uh, as a judge as well. So what's your favorite role, competing or being a judge? I honestly, I really like both. I mean, I don't like judging exclusively dessert television shows, although I like dessert real competitions like the Valrona one at Star mm-hmm. Chefs. That, that was mm-hmm. fun to judge because the quality of the product and the ingredients they use is so high. And then also the qual- the chefs are amazing. Like they all make very spectacular dessert stuff with Valrona. But d- judging like, it's fun for a minute to judge a donut competition, but for 10 episodes, <laughs> you start to feel like a total gluttonous pig. You know? <laughs> so, I don't love like tasting sweets all day Yeah. at all. I mean, it's not even like, I don't even make super sweet desserts at all. So I just, that's, like, that's my worst job. If somebody would, if, like, I'm work, like, think that if somebody had a salad competition show that it was actually, you had to, like, not just make a simple salad, but, like, you know, like, if it was just about salad, I would love to judge that because I can mm-hmm. handle that, you know? Sure. Yes. It's a, or, like, I, but I also, like, I've judged the D'Artagnan Pâté en Cru and mm-hmm. uh, the um, Cassoulet every okay. year for the last few years with Ariane. And, um, oh my, that is so, I mean, the cassoulet is so intense because obviously it's so rich, sure. but that is such a fun competition. Cause again, the, the, they're just all delicious, yeah. but it's yeah. also like, you pork know, fat. it's <laughs> pork sausages and pork fat and, yeah. <laughs> uh, lots of beans. I mean, it's just, it's perfect in February in, in New York, you know, to be judging that cause it's when That's you want to eat that. Going back to um, the beginning when uh, you opened Citizen Cake uh, in San Francisco, as, as you said, you, you came from really like the, the traditional culinary uh, school and then the French fine dining and so on. So how did you make the, the switch to that type of space to into like dishes and dessert that was, say, served in, uh, in cases or like in a display in a, in a shop? Because that's a really different approach here in business. Oh, it is. Yes. You know, honestly, there was a learning curve for us. My right-hand person, Sarah Co. she was um, with me at Rubicon and we yeah. opened up Citizen Cake together. And I remember, you know, we were like, wow, this seems like the pastry case wants to suck the life out of everything that we make. And <laughs> of course, this is a while ago too. So, you know, this is like 23 years ago. I think the display cases have gotten a lot better these days. But I still think, you know, that's why they created, I'm positive, that's why Napage was created, so that you could put a thick gelatinous glaze over the tarts and stuff so that it wouldn't dry out the pastry. And, we know, we just had to kind of, when we were so inventive, but we also just learned a lot about how to deal with the circumstances that it wasn't plated dessert anymore that we could, you know, plated dessert is such a special thing. I mean, especially, and I think we can all really appreciate plated food in general or a cocktail in a glass more than ever after this year because, you know, you, everything is to go and sure, in a box sure. or in a plastic cup. I just love that plated dessert or plated food world where, you know, you've got like five or six people putting every, all these things on a plate and it comes mm-hmm. together and it's so special and it serves the temperature it's supposed to be. And it might have multiple temperatures, including frozen things and hot things. And, you know, it's such a, amazing orchestration so i still i think still think that that's my favorite world of eating but i can out of experience i can appreciate like you know i can really appreciate people right now who are having to put everything into go boxes who are really great chefs and really thinking what the experience is going to be like you know an hour later or two hours later when it gets to somebody's house i mean i think we're going to see even more creative food stuff and more creative packaging as we kind of mm-hmm. keep going into this next year. You, as you said, it was like 23 years ago and opening like a store. So it was probably very challenging because 
pastry chef at the at that time were not the most uh, I would say popular. Correct. So if you go to a restaurant, everything was around like the the name of the chef, you know, of the culinary chef, and uh, like the pastry chef was not really like uh, front and center. So yes, and, yeah. and on top of that, you you open you know this with this store. So can you um, share with us a little bit like the challenges that you faced at that time and and the, the mindset as well of the of society you know at the time that was probably not ready for that. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It was a very different time. Uh, I remember when I first started working. I mean, my first cooking job was at a little bistro, a little French bistro called Cafe Claude in San Francisco on Claude mm-hmm. Lane. There was a female chef and it was a very small place, but it was very like we had live jazz and all French waiters. And it was very, very simple menu with a very tiny kitchen, but it was fast paced. And, and then I started making desserts. So About a year into it, I got this job at Massa's. Which, Massa's was the, one of the best French restaurants next to Fleur, Fleur de Lis in the city. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it was just it was just a perfectionist kind of kitchen. And uh, Julian was French tra- French and Swiss trained, I think. And um, he was from Spain. And so it was just a very dynamic place. And our pastry chef, Alicia Toyoka, had also worked with some great pastry chefs. But she really... And she was just amazing. Like I, t- I learned so much in that time with her. But she, again, like I don't think that her name was ever on the menu. I just remember going to restaurants and going, gosh, there's only like a couple places where you know the pastry chef's name. And I can, as I recall, I remember like Emily Lucchetti was, you know, like we knew she was a great pastry chef at Stars with Jeremiah. We knew mm-hmm. Lindsay Shear was a great pastry chef working at Chez Panisse with Alice. And then we were barely starting to see pastry chefs' names on menus. We knew I knew of some great pastry chefs in New York, and of course I went to Stage. I went to Stage with Mary Check, who also was becoming this. She was had such an avant-garde approach to plated desserts, and so she was coming from Chicago. And I remember when she opened up Cypress Club in San Francisco, she made more spectacular desserts than the menu, than the savory mm-hmm. menu. Like her, the only thing that can compete with the architecture in that restaurant the, or the interior design was Mary Check's desserts. I think that was at the very beginning when we started to get this pastry chef started to get more recognition and like Francois Payard was coming up yeah. and I remember going to Claude Trogro's restaurant and Laurent Torrendel was just also coming up and I remember but I remember how extraordinary I just remember so many desserts from that time because they just they just started to feel well obviously I was so into it but like it just started to feel like wow the Pastry chefs are doing crazy cool stuff. Bill Yosis, you know, was working for David Boulay. So when I got to go to all these cities, I often went with Mary Check. The first time I cooked at the Beard House was with Mary Check. And uh, this was so long ago. And so it was like we would just go out of our way to try other people's sweets and stuff. And, and then, like, uh, you know, the Beard Foundation didn't have – I mean, it still isn't – It's this country is so strange about desserts. Like, you have places like France and Spain – And Japan, mm-hmm. where people there are so, so many different cultures around dessert stuff, but th- those three countries I can think of have really taken dessert to this much higher level early on in the from the pastry shop to two plated desserts. And um, you know, we've seen a lot happen over the over the last few decades, but okay, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it just wasn't like. At the time, it just like you'd never like when we opened up Citizen Cake. When I opened it in 1997, what an unusual thing for somebody to be coming out of a fine dining restaurant mm-hmm. with Tracy Desjardins to say, you know, I, I remember thinking, okay, all the sous chefs move on and they open their own restaurants, but I'm kind of like one of the sous chefs here, and I need to go do my own thing. And so I just thought, you know, I met this guy who roasted coffee, and we opened up the first. Citizen cake that was very contemporary looking on the inside design wise, but we roasted coffee and we made, we had a wood burning oven made by a very famous oven maker, Alan Scott. We did breads and uh, pizza and then we did a lot of our pastries in there or reheating of stuff, you know, for if we did like a hazelnut Levon toasted and with Sharpenberger chocolate on it and pears and ricotta cheese with hazelnuts, you know, we would just do that in the wood burning oven because it was, It was sitting right there next to the yep. front. So uh-huh. it was it was so cool because that just seemed like how it how, it was all the things that I wanted. I could do chocolate work in the back. I could make all these fantastical looking cakes that look like modern architecture. 
and not Dr. Seuss things um, or, <laughs> or uh, Art Deco. And then we could do our breads. And, you know, I've always loved baking, making doughs, pizza doughs, breads. And we could, you know, it was just like learning this whole new way of cooking in fire. And then we also roasted coffee. So, you know, like now when I look around and I go, there's so many amazing small coffee roasteries. And right. they have oftentimes, they don't make their own pastries there, but they have such high-end pastries. Like San Francisco has got a whole different scene now of mm -hmm. coffee and pastry. But at the time, that just really didn't exist. I mean, there were some cool pastry places in Berkeley and a couple of shops in San Francisco, but nothing like today. And it wasn't even like a big, it was, all, San Francisco's always had a, a good coffee culture. You know, it's just predating Starbucks and all that stuff too, sure, um, sure. which was amazing time because North Beach had some good coffee roasteries and, you know, there were like a handful of lo hobbyists and, and my, the guy, Bob, who I opened up the first shop with, he roasted really good coffee as a hobby And um, it just ended up like being, I think we've really helped put that stamp on San Francisco as far as like, hey, when you come to this town, you can get really good coffee and you can get really good pastry. And with um, where you are, a source of inspiration and a time for, for your pastries. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I came in there before Tartine opened and before yeah. Pascal at La Boulange. I know we helped change the face of, of that side of the food sector in San Francisco. And that, that it's very gratifying to me. When people say, oh, every time I go to San Francisco now, they're like, you know, open another Citizen Cake. And I'm like, no, why would I do that? There's, there's, you know, you got like all these other talented people now. You know? Yeah. And then after that, you change you know, radically because you, you uh, moved to uh, New York and mm -hmm. switch into like the culinary world. The truth is that like, you know, I came up with this name Citizen Cake, you know, in 1997 when, before, yeah. when we opened that shop. But then eventually, you know, like a year, two years later, we moved to um, Hayes Valley yeah. in San Francisco. And that that place was much bigger than the original one. And we became, a, we were a full restaurant, bar, patisserie. Uh -huh. So we had everything and we were, you know, open all day and night. So, it, you know, it was always really, we have always done savory food. We always did savory food. It's just that my name, Citizen Cake, makes you think it was just a cake shop. And that's kind of unfortunate because in when I think of the name Citizen Cake that I came up with is like, you know, obviously has a reference to Citizen Kane, the movie, sure, of course. Um, and which is a yeah. grandiose movie. You know, it's like one of the best, one of the most mm -hmm. classic famous films ever. And, uh, and to me, Citizen Cake it sort of embodied that idea of, of what the, you know, the basis of the movie is built on. It just it was sensational. It was a headlining kind of name. It seemed like, not yellow journalism like the movie but but it just had this sort of big it just it, it, it encompassed a lot more than just cakes but someday i will do a citizen cake cookbook that represents what citizen cake really was i never did it because i just didn't want to give it all away back then or i, I didn't i couldn't wrap my head around how how that book should be and i didn't want it to be some thin little tiny You know, okay, because the, the, the first book that you wrote, the demolition desserts were based on the what, like the pastry from citizen cake at the time, only the, well, the, the but it was part. also based on the whole hit my whole history of dessert stuff. So it went back in time a little bit to some of how in the world I arrived at citizen cake in the first place. Got it. Um, it's more about like the mind of remodeling dessert stuff that it kind of, or hybridizing dessert stuff that exists out there, but how can we make it even more fantastical? So, yeah, I mean, the publisher wanted Citizen Cake written on that cover of that book. They wanted it to be called the Citizen Cake book. And I couldn't, I was like, you know, actually, I can't even get to the Citizen Cake book yet because I've got to explain where I'm coming from first. And um, sure. that's okay. what Demolition Desserts is about. But the, and then my second book came after doing the, the next Iron Chef, Mm -hmm. where I obviously kind of proved to people that I wasn't just making cupcakes and bread pudding all day. Um, that in fact, I do think of savory food and rethink it in other ways. And so that, that really was sort of my first way to sort of talk to a bigger audience about my savory side on, on national television. And then because uh, people love citizen cake, but I always hired a chef to cuisine, obviously. And they kind of would always get the credit for all the savory food, even though I worked with them on the food, like as any executive chef would. But it was just such an unheard of time. I mean, I remember like having savory chefs that just couldn't believe, like how in the world could the pastry chef be the boss? 
And I'm mm-hmm. like, you guys, I'm not just a pastry chef. I think of all the stuff. So like when you make this steak tartare dish, I want you to really rethink it. It can't just be same as it ever was. You've got to use some other ingredients that, like we do in the, sa- on the pastry side to say, yeah, this is steak tartare, but it's got this black garlic emulsion and it's got something else that we haven't heard of yet, you know? Yeah. So can you give us some example of, uh, because you played in, uh, you know, in, in both genre in, uh, in desserts and then in culinary world. And do you have any example of things that you can share with us of ingredients that maybe belongs to uh, the sweet world and that you apply in, in savory and, and reverse? Oh, yeah. I, it, it's almost like it's it, it's because I kind of I feel like I, I'm kind of always studying different kinds of cuisine and cultures of people through cuisines and the language of spices and the language of technique in different cultures. I would say one of my favorite ingredients that I would throw into, I have a couple come to mind. It's very easy for me. I use orange flower water, mm-hmm. like, you know, which is very common in the pastry sure. pantry to put into baklava and phyllo things or, you know, in cannolis or, I mean, I, you know, we use orange flower water or some flower waters in, in a lot of pastry through the Mediterranean and mm-hmm. the Ottoman Empire into you know, even in Morocco and North Africa into France and everything yep. and Italy. But I also like, I love using that as an ingredient with um, just like an orange and or like orange lemon vinaigrette with co- toasted cumin with hmm. carrots and or lentils and, or like I, and like I was just in China last year and I love like people typically eat mung beans in yep. a, sweet application and tofu in a savory application. So uh, my, but mung beans are just, I mean, I just love mung beans. They're like tiny little tight green black eyed peas almost. And I like them um, al dente a little bit. So I love making like a salad with mung beans, for example, and maybe the mung bean sprouts too. And then maybe using that orange flower water Uh somewhere in the vinaigrette, but I might use some, Szechuan, Szechuan chilies and peppercorns in that vinaigrette too. So just like, I'm really playful with a lot of things if it works, you know, and sometimes yeah. I try stuff and I go, no, actually this is not good, but I it, I have to go there in order to understand where my limitations are. Mm-hmm. And then last year when I was in China, I came up with a dessert using creamy soft tofu, but in a dessert, which is very unusual. Like you would never go to China and have tofu in a dessert. It doesn't exist. Like people just wouldn't eat that. It, why would you do that? You know, like it belongs with, pickled mustard greens and or show you or you know, I mean like soy sauce and you know different things like that I made like a black sesame fermented black bean caramel sauce and oh. then a black sesame streusel mm-hmm. and then served out with a, just you know kettle creamy tofu and it's like but why wouldn't you do that tofu feels like panna cotta to me so I like that combination so much of like, and also fermented black beans, you know, the Chinese black bean in the caramel sauce in dessert. <laughs> it's so unusual, but it's like, it's salty and it has umami. Of course it belongs yeah. together in a caramel sauce, you know, but that was fun because I think both Western and Eastern culture can kind of go, Oh my God, I don't even know what this is, but it's really tasty. I love that. I, lo- I love that surprise of like, Hey, I know we don't totally always do this kind of stuff, but, it actually kind of works here, you know? Sure. Um, but, um, that's what I, I always liked, you know, um, talking with you. It's, it's really like, you know, challenging the statu quo and, uh, and because people, wherever you go, you know, I'm, I'm from France. It's exactly the same. It's very rigid and structured here in the U.S. The same thing about people loving putting like labels, you know, on, on people. You are, mm-hmm. you belong to the pastry world. You belong to the culinary world. And the yeah. fact that you're always, you know, challenging this and, and mixing both genres as, as a prequel. What allows me to do that is that I really do think about the food world as, as an artistic medium and mm-hmm. also as languages. So I'm not trying to offend anybody by not speaking their language perfectly, by making a dish, a variation on their classic dish. It's more like I w- I'll have to make your traditional dish to understand it. And and especially if I go to the region and then I can really understand why it's been made this way for so many years. And then I can come back away from it and say, yeah, but I live in the United States. I'm not of this other heritage anyway. So 
I'm not trying to be offensive and, and appropriated or anything. I'm just trying to understand the storytelling and understand the language so that I can merge it with other languages that I might have opinions and ideas about and put them and why not? I mean, it's kind of what we're always migrating people. I mean, humans have always migrated and changed recipes around the world because, you know, you have a war here, you're oppressed over here and you move over here and you want to bring your culture, but you don't have all the same ingredients. So you turn it into something that's that version of it. Right. That's just what we do. So I feel like it's the same idea. We have a a country of uh, so many amazing people and so many cultures from around the world. We should celebrate that rather than just try to push each other in our own lanes. Absolutely. Yeah, I had a a good discussion recently in an episode. I had uh, Chef uh, Carlo Lamagna from uh, Seattle, you know, with um, Philippine Philippine heritage. And we talked a lot around, you know, those different influences. And because Filipino cuisine is really... (laughs) <laughs> you know, a center of like many, many influences throughout. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. That was pretty. It's got, it's got so many influences. Yeah. So, you know, what's so uh, surprising to me is how many countries and cuisines have been influenced by Portuguese. Such a small, mm-hmm. such a small country that dominated so much in culinary for so long, right? Yeah, it's just absolutely. amazing. And I, I was fascinated in listening to him because he was mentioning something that didn't really occur to me. Because we always look at the world and the map, you know, from a certain perspective. And, and he was saying that, uh, you know, the, like the, the Spanish influence on Filipino cuisine. But in fact, he said it was more like the Mexican influence. I mean, it was like the Spanish influence in Mexico and then Mexico to Philippines. Oh, uh, yeah. From, wow. a, from a map standpoint, Mexico is much, much closer to the Philippines. And, um, you know, in fact, the, colonization came from Mexico rather directly from Spain. So I thought it was, mm-hmm. it was pretty cool to, um, to hear that. But, you know, I, I'm always fascinating around, you know, the inspiration that it can come from travel. So you, you just mentioned that you spent quite a bit of time in, in China last year and in, in Thailand mm-hmm. I think as well. So I'm curious, like, can you maybe uh, dig into your memories of, of travels and, and share with us maybe two uh, food aha moments that uh, you you had when uh, you traveled there. Oh yeah, in, in Thailand. Yeah, 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 a hundred percent. Because I was uh, I was over there for a month. I was, I was doing some work with Yale University last year with the hospitality team from okay. Yale, and then I happened to go with uh, Professor Paul Friedman, and I took my friend Anita Lowe, Chef Anita Lowe from New York, mm-hmm. with me. It was, we were looking at a lot of, we went, had to go to some different conferences and talk about and look into plant forward cuisines historically of China. That was sort of my mission there. Of course, we tried a lot of different, you know, everything along the way. But I would say, like, and we went from Beijing to Chengdu in the Sichuan province. And the uh, Sichuan province had such a massive impact on me. I had always known that this would be kind of an amazing culinary area. With in history, but mm-hmm. with the Sichuan peppercorns and the and the profile of spices that are, or the mala in their cuisine is is just so haunting and delicious and memorable. And uh, I met some I met a really great woman who was teaching kids uh, how to grow things in the garden, cook them, and be at the sit at the table with the family because she was genuinely worried that there were already a few decades of Chinese people that weren't learning these traditions passed down. And, uh, and so she reminded me so much of Alice Waters from the edible schoolyard projects that she started. And, um, and I had, I just kept saying, gosh, you know, this is such a disaster around the world. If we, it's already this way in America and I'm sure it's happening in Europe more and more, unfortunately, and happening in Asia where, you know, kids just are not, you know, learning where carrots actually grow from and how to prepare them and how to sit, uh, set a table and sit down with the family instead of being preoccupied with video games and technology. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I know it's a challenge for everybody, but it, it, it just really, I just thought that was so phenomenal. We met this little girl, seven years old, who in fact made chine, uh, chopstick noodles for us by hand and then oh, wow. um, prepare prepared them and with her grandmother and her mother in the kitchen and then sat down and played some Chopin for us. And then we sat down and all together and had lunch. And I just, it was just so magical. 
And then I, so I walked away from there just like loving all of the flavors, the hot pot, the mapo tofu, the Sichuan rabbit heads with the chili oil on it and going to the market and eating a fresh green Sichuan peppercorn, which kind of mm-hmm. like blew out, blew out my whole mouth for a couple of hours. And the pristineness of the market that we went to, like there were so many surprises to me in China. Uh, it's a very wealthy country now, you know, and, um, mm-hmm. and also just that some of the markets were just sort of like, I mean, they were spectacular and so exciting because they had like all these different kinds of noodles and, you know, I just love all that stuff. And anyway, and then also uh, Shanghai, which, you know, is such a classy town to, and all the, you know, just going to all these cities in China where there's millions of people, like I've always heard that, but like it, just to see a functioning city, I was just, it, it was really kind of exceptional. And then, um, but Shanghai was, was a standout place because it's so glamorous in its own, it has its own history of being sort of almost like the Hollywood of China. Huh. And it's quite beautiful and spectacular. And yeah, it's smoggy, but so is LA and so is New York. And uh, anyway, so I just, I walked away just experiencing so much more, so much more depth and and picking up some of the, um, I mean, hearing the different dialects from the different, going from Beijing down to further south. And then also knowing, hearing some some people on our trip speaking Chinese, but having not understanding some dialects was, it's just so fascinating. You know, there's just so, so much history there. And then of course, Thailand, I knew I would fall in love with, and I, I was trying to figure out how I could just stay there because it was like everything. It's just really? so beautiful. The food, the people are so, so it's very different to go from China to Thailand. People in Thailand are, have this very soft disp- disposition and, it's so friendly and the language is very floral. It's so tropical and you have coconuts in all its different forms, fresh yeah. grated, whatever, sugar, coconut palm sugar everywhere. And then the fish sauce. I'm a huge fan of fish sauce. I love putting fish sauce randomly in dessert stuff too, where people don't know what it is, but they're like, I really like that. And it's oh, what, like, what, do you, what do you put the fish sauce in? in dessert? Maybe sometimes in, I mean, especially if you're talking about like caramelized notes, because yeah. You know, like any kind of like caramel sauce with a little bit of fish sauce is just with Brazil nuts, for example, is so tasty. And that could uh-huh. be a savory or sweet application. I have put it in tiramisu before. I call it, what do I call it? Tiramisu funky. Um, <laughs> yeah. I like always your, your like creativity when it comes to naming. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's I know it sounds so weird, but it's just like, you know, it's the salty runoff of curing anchovies basically or other yeah. seafood and you, um you know a uh, chef uh sorry to interrupt but you know okay. chef uh, chris shefford in uh in houston uh he is oh, uh, so. an, another guy who is i mean he's he's in the survey world but he is really obsessed you know with uh, fish sauce and uh so he uh, you two should have a conversation <laughs> yeah totally yeah i've never <laughs> been to one of those i know that some of my Chef friends have been to like the Red Boat, you know, where they make fish sauce. Mm-hmm. They've been on some tour with a. I've never been to like a fish sauce or a Colatura house, but I, I am going to Sicily for the first time next year. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and I think yeah. I, maybe that I might run into some of that. So that would be amazing. I'm sure it's really yeah. funky, but well, hopefully, yeah. hopefully the whole uh, pandemic situation is going to slow down. That's a little tough. I mean, uh, I, obviously, I would like to chat a little bit with uh, with you about you know about it, and uh, because you you know you you have you have a role as well in terms of consultants and uh, helping you know others in the, in the industry. So you know, how how do you see this uh, pandemic uh, impacting you know the uh, the industry for for the I would oh, say yeah. the long run? It is painful to have to hear and see so many of my friends going through this something that you know it's like they didn't do anything wrong it, sure. it's not their fault and they're not getting any assistance with it and it's just and I've also you know I've been working on this documentary that will hopefully be coming out in the next few months um Sorry, we are closed that's the yes. one yes. yeah and uh it's looking really good we we just have to we're in in editing still but and a few more things to do to it. But but I've had lots of uh, conversations uh, in this film with so many people that everybody knows mm-hmm. from both coasts and a lot of people virtually in between. And we're right in, in the film, we're right in the middle of it with 
COVID and also the inequities with Black Lives Matter yeah. and all of this stuff coming to a head. So on the one hand, yes, it's not it's unfair and it's painful. You know, some people have pivoted and done some, you know, where they're mm-hmm. They had a small to-go business, but it's become a much bigger thing. But that's rare. You know, that's not the, the normal thing right now. But I do think it's going to certainly create more or people will become more creative around how to how many, you know, the, the model, the plan, the structure is going to be different because you can say, OK, well, I'm going to do fine dining because that's just who I am. But I'm only going to do, you know, a couple nights a week or I'm going to do only this many covers and just kind of restructure the plan. And, and maybe that's outside of a brick and mortar place that you put invest so much money in. I mean, I, to me, the biggest problem here is the investment that people have had to make in uh, brick and mortar places that yeah. they can't open at their full capacity. So what that just, that just throws a, you know, a cannonball at the restaurant because you, if you buy into a place and you say, I'm going to put in 50 seats and I have to do 150 covers, and you can't. And they're, they're people, they're just saying you can't do that. So like, why would you, you, so great. So let's just take people outside of the brick and mortar or let's stop trying to like, why do we, why is it so expensive? This commercial real estate, you know, like it's uh, obviously that's going to have to change and I don't sure. know when, but I think that's going to have to evolve over the next five, 10 years where it's like, okay, well, what moronic person would go into a brick and mortar place and invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into a space that we don't know when another pandemic might hit, you know, like, how is that going to work? So you think it's going to be more and more like uh, the ghost kitchen uh, concept. I think we will see more and more of those for sure. And I think we'll Mm -hmm. just also, I think people will reimagine along with, you know, architects and stuff, what a dining of what an ideal Mm -hmm. dining scenario might look like. And maybe it is like more tinted stuff outside where you have your own little pod or whatever, mm-hmm. but like some people will come up with better designs for the air, air circulation. My friend Simon Kim, who owns um, Coat, Korean yeah. steakhouse in, in New York City, was talking about these grills that they have on the table. They're, it's very modern and cool, and that I love that restaurant. It's very sexy. And you grill, you know, you grill all these different cuts of beef on the Korean barbecue, but the grill itself sucks the air down instead of it, uh, instead of a hood overhead. And this is a, true in a lot of Chinese places too, like that you've got the air circulation around the fire. And so that actually can, maybe that's going to help. I mean, somebody, he was talking to somebody about it, how it, the germs can't pass around the table because this thing is sucking all of the air oh, wow. into, into the heat. And okay. so when you start thinking about, oh, well, maybe we just have to rethink air systems, you know, and stuff like that. Invest, that's investment though. You know? Yeah, but um, other people will want to invest their inventions into that, you know. So mm. but I just think there's it's sure for sure it's a changing time. Um, in my film, I talked to Alice Waters and she talks about climate change. And, you know, this is we are just preparing ourselves for a future right now. Um, mm-hmm. I think some 100 years from now, people are going to be like, I can't believe they just wore these cotton masks. You know, they'll have Darth Vader <laughs> masks on or something. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. <laughs> I think it's a changing time. For sure. Mm-hmm. I just want to to finish like the our conversation with a, a short uh, series of rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> Let's assume that there is no uh, pandemic, and uh, you and I are going uh, to uh, do like a tasting tour in LA. Uh, mm. What are like the five spots you would take me to? Oh my God, that's such a great question because like I've moved out here during the pandemic. So like I haven't even been to all the places I would like to go to, you know, they, I've seen some you know places have to shut down and change and stuff, but I would for sure say in Naka, you know, Nikki Nakayama yep. and Carol, they just, they're doing like really high end bento boxes during this whole time. And they're just exceptional. And I, I just love their food is so, so good and so special I also like um, Jordan Kahn at um, Destroyer, and mm-hmm. luckily I went there in January. Um, not to the – I went to the – there's the restaurant, and then there's the sort of cafe. I went to the cafe, and I'm trying to – I forgot what it's called. I, I have to look it up. It's what it's Jordan Kahn's. It's like the Destroyer and then the other one. But he does such – you know, and he's a started as a pastry chef, and his food is really otherworldly. Like you don't – 
really know what in the world you're eating. And, but it all makes like, it's all just delicious, but it, I feel like I'm, I've landed on another planet when I eat his food and it's really fun. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm. who gets, I don't ever get to do that. That's fun. And I love, I know Lincoln Carson has um, shut down bone tomps, but that guy is so talented and it's been, been really hard, you know, with him having to shut it down, but I would go eat some of his food somewhere, anywhere, maybe just in, you know, for fun in the backyard. And then let's see. I also, you know, I've been to a couple of pop-ups at Daniel Patterson's restaurant at West Adams and Naisha Arrington was cooking over there one day. I, I like this, like, you know, maybe we just start doing more chefs are already kind of like, you know, considered rock stars. So why you just go on tour, or you show up and do lots of pop-ups and stuff like sure. that. It's yeah. kind of just fun way to experience people's food. And it's very alive because they're not trying to just sell this menu over and over again. And, and maybe it's as well, it's a, it's a good platform for collaboration as well. So, yeah. 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 And I also love this chef, um, May Lynn. She had a restaurant <laughs> called Nightshade and I think she's getting ready to open a fried chicken sandwich shop or something, you know, I mean, sure. May Lynn makes really amazing, spectacular food. She used to work with Michael Votaggio and I just love her. She's one of the most talented chefs in this whole city. And, uh, and of course we'd have to go to Moza because Moza is my favorite restaurant. Cause I love Nancy Silverton. She's, Sure, yeah. chef and a chef you know and she's so loved here and i just and she's so particular about her kind of food and her palate i know it really well yeah i haven't met no. her yet. i haven't met oh, her yeah. yet <laughs> and she's doing you know like the, she's amazing because they still have to go you know they had some break-in stuff during the um oh really oh. during the um, protests but she's already remodeled some of that stuff. And she's always just like trying to, she made a piazza in the back that used to be like a par- two car parking area. She's just been dealing with COVID like constantly and just trying mm-hmm. to make it work, make something work, you know, trying to keep people employed. So I just, I love her for a million reasons, but I also just love her food. Very good. Yeah. So what's your favorite guilty pleasure food? Probably pizza. Pizza. Yeah. What pizza. Kind? What, what topping? I mean, I make pizza a lot, and I, I like it just a margarita pizza. But, um, but I, you know, I just I have a, a new girlfriend out here, and she has two kids, and I we actually just went to Mozza last night, and I ordered a bunch of stuff online, and we picked up like four different kinds of pizzas, and they were all phenomenal. So, but I also and Nancy makes this crazy good salted peanut butter gelato it's just uh-huh. kind of insane with candied peanuts inside and it wouldn't be my first flavor that i would pick but it's it's really good okay um but i you know and ice cream for sure too i just like so many things okay so um can you give us like three cookbooks that inspired you the most in your career oh let's see probably zuni cafe okay san francisco zuni it's such a great book it's such a well-written book it's and i don't know if you ever went there but Judy Rogers was had such an influence on me, and I never worked for her. And then I'm looking at my cookbooks over here. You know, yeah, I can. I I I I wanted to say that I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know whose cookbook I really love, but it hasn't been. It's only it's come in later in my life because it wasn't written that long ago. But it's Mary Cell Presia's The Grand Grand Cocina Latina. Oh yeah, um, okay. that was a, such a great book. Both of these books I just told you are edited by Alex Gurney Shelley's mother. Maria Gernichelli. I'm trying to think of like what's been the most. I have, of course, lots of. I have Pierre Hermé books and I have Albert Adria oh, yeah. books because the in the dessert world, I would say all of those guys have influenced me a lot too. I have a lot of cookbooks though. I mean, I actually. I'm sure. <laughs> I have more than I can even put on display, and I have been influenced over the years by so many different people's cookbooks, and I just love having them. I, of all the things, I've moved back and forth across the country twice now, and I've schlepped all these cookbooks with me. <laughs> what is your biggest pet, pee- pet peeves in, um, you know, in the kitchen? I think I, my biggest pet peeve is people just not being clean and organized. I mean, I think it's always been a. I, I know that it's I, you know, being a pastry chef first, I've been very, you know, I have to be a very disciplined, organized person in the pastry kitchen because classically a lot of savory cooks were never, never had the same kind of discipline. And so we always kept all the special equipment yeah. in pastry. And then the savory chefs would have to ask for it, <laughs> bring it back. Uh, Cause we can't afford to lose things in the kitchen at all, but I think it's evolving already. So I think a lot of cooks have are mindful about 
uh, that it, there isn't too much of a divide anymore between savory and sweet. I'd like to think so. Okay. So you said you're going to uh, Sicily uh, hopefully next year, and then you just been to uh, you know last year to China and Thailand. What's your next dream food exploration destination? Yeah, I mean for sure Sicily has been big on my list for a long time because I've just never been there. I've been to a lot of parts of Italy, but not that far south. Uh -huh. I've been to Japan, but it was in uh, it was 20 years ago, and I would like to go back there. Yeah. Um, such a special place, but also like I've never been to, I'd love to go to Africa and at Morocco, you know, I've never been anywhere. The closest I've been in the Middle East is to Turkey and, you know, it's so different Muslim, like having, it's just yeah. such a different culture. And there's so many classic, amazing histories that come from food from all those regions. And I just love all that kind of stuff. I'd love to go back to China to the Yunnan mm -hmm. region. And then I'd love to go to Vietnam and Cambodia and Malaysia. I've never been to Singapore. You know, there's lots of places I haven't been. Okay. Uh, I've never been to like Sweden or Iceland or Finland, but I think those are all kind of interesting places. And I haven't been to Denmark. Since, yeah, Denmark is um, very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't been there for 30 something years. Yeah. So I, it's, I haven't experienced the, the, you know, the Nordic revolution of food sure. in that whole Where we region. Know and everything. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I was, uh, it's interesting because you're mentioning some of the countries and I was lucky to to uh, visit. I spent, um, I went with my younger son to Japan in October, in fact, last year. We spent 14 days and that, that was amazing. And then I went with my daughter to Morocco, uh, in fact, um, the year before. Oh, cool. And um, yeah, in fact, I, I got some... Uh, some advice from Murad, you know, Chef Murad. Um, yeah, on, yeah. You know, on places to go. So, oh, so I, cool. I really um, recommend it highly. So, very cool. Mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if you could teleport uh, yourself in any restaurant in the world for dinner tonight, where would you go? There is a, well, I mean, I should go to places I've never been. There was a, there's a chef in Istanbul who I really admire, and mm -hmm. I was watching her on Instagram the other day making some kind of pasta thing that I've never seen in my life. And it was like, she did an egg dough, like, you know, just like you would make pasta dough. And she rolled it out with a rolling pin, but super, super thin, like you could see through it. And then she um, stuffed it with something that looked like kale and probably onions and spices and stuff. And then she just made this interesting little envelope that wasn't really like any fold I've ever seen before and stuck it on this tiered steaming tray thing and steamed wow. it and put some kind of like looks like chili oil on top and I was just like where does that come from what is I don't even know and it's all you know her name is Semsa Denisel and she's a highly respected chef and educator in Istanbul Turkey mm -hmm. I think it in Istanbul or outside of Istanbul yeah. now and she's good friends with Anna Sortun from Oleana and Sofra mm -hmm. in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who I love also. But I had a really good lunch there one time with my mother in Istanbul, and I would go back and have her food any day because it was like it's just so foreign to me, you know. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you you obviously have done a lot of things in the the, the dessert and pastry world and in the culinary world. Any uh, attempt to do anything in uh, in the spirit world, like uh, cocktails and uh, and drinks? Oh, yeah. I make cocktails all the time, especially during this COVID time. I like, I just, yeah. I mean, I love, well, I love a lot of different things. I love different twists on Negronis and different twists on Manhattans. Okay. Um, oftentimes I add, and same with margaritas, but I love taking like, at this time of year, especially when I was in New York, I always wanted more bourbon drinks. Mm -hmm. I love bourbon and like a, like a man, this is my kind of Manhattan. I would like bourbon and vermouth or some kind of vermouth and like maybe Carpana Antica, but there's so many other ones too. And then a little bit of Nocino. Mm -hmm. I love Nocino, the green walnut liqueur. Yeah. And then some tart cherry juice. Oh, Not wow. a lot, okay. but just a little. And I like to shake that up and serve it on ice with a Meyer lemon twist mm -hmm. or, uh, or some uh, Amarina cherries or, or brandy cherries. Very cool. That's perfect for this time of year. Yeah. But then I'm in California. So we drink, you know, um, tequila and mezcal a lot so. here because we have citrus all the time. And like, I, in fact, out, moving out here, I have a, a nice little 
deck and I have a Meyer lemon tree and a yuzu tree. Oh, nice. And I just recently got two yuzu, three yuzu fruit off my tree and made some yuzu kosho. And then I still have one more that I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with it. Because that, that fruit is so tasty in cocktails too. Very cool. I might just can't, and I got a Buddha's hand and candied that oh, recently. Oh, cool. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's I love, the, I love the so luxury much to be yeah. in, um, you know, based in California. I have to wait, you know, like the like end of maybe you know, June to put my citrus tree back to my, on outside my deck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Totally. So I'm jealous. I know it's ridiculous. I go to the farmer's market here now, you know, like I've lived here before, but it's been 10 years and I just am kind of like, it's just such an exciting time at the farmer's market because yeah. I know all the citrus fruit from Northern California, but then I don't even know all of the pot, all the varietals that are even just further South. Mm-hmm. So like the other day I got, these guys were telling me that I've seen pomelos. I've obviously yeah. applied pomelos and Oro Blanco grapefruits and the pink grapefruits, but then there was some other one that I can't even remember its name now, and it tasted like peppery really? grapefruit meets some kind of rain pearl lime. It had just such a, it was so perfect for cocktails because you're like, oh my God, it's like grapefruit and lime came together and made this giant fruit. It had such an exotic uh, aroma to it. And then also I found some Kishu tangerines, which are these light, little teeny tangerines oh that are God. only mm-hmm. like one week out of the year. Yeah, it's just, it's like, it's just a kid in a candy store every day here at the farmer's market. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question, when are we going to read your memoir? I know. And so I've decided that I've got to finish this next draft of it uh, at the end of January. I'm cl- I've been writing a lot. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't write for a few months during COVID because it just was it just was too hard. It was just such a weird time. Right. Sure. But then all of a sudden I started writing sort of in the middle of the summer. And so I've kind of shifted where it was before. I, You know, I, I have already turned in a completed manuscript a couple of years ago and then uh, my agent at the time really liked it, and then but just nobody bought it. And I don't know, maybe it just wasn't time for it yet. But it's starting to feel like, also the changes I've made to it, it feels like this might be we're getting close to okay time for it. Very yeah. good. I'm yeah. also like happy where with what I think I'm in a better place with it even since COVID happened because my story it has a lot to do with let, ha, um, losing restaurants and the feeling and the emotion I had around it. Mm-hmm. So it may be more appropriate since we've gone through this sort of terrifying period of restaurant change. True. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, chef uh, for uh, oh my God. to be a guest uh, on the podcast. I really had a blast. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for, ta- for talking with me about everything. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I think that we can continue <laughs> the conversation for another hour. <laughs> I know. We'll, so, we'll do that later. Some other time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Flavors Unknown podcast. To learn more about Elizabeth Faulkner's work, visit her website at elizabethfaulkner.com. You can find her as well on social media on Instagram and Twitter at Chef Faulkner. We put all this information and more in the show notes of this episode that you can find on the website flavorsunknown.com. If you like this episode, And if you want to hear more of my conversation with trending chefs, pastry chefs, and mixologists, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you are listening to podcasts. And please share this episode with friends and colleagues. I want to give a shout out to a great forum and educational resource called The Learning Chef. It is created by chefs for chefs. And they have a great Facebook page and Facebook group called The Learning Chef. So please check it out. In two weeks, my guest will be Sylvia Barben from Larina Restaurant in Brooklyn. We're obviously going to talk a lot about Italian heritage and pasta. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.